Myself, Dr. Jibran Ahmed presents to you Simply Pathology and today we are back with a very important lecture. We are going to continue Cell as a Unit of Health and Disease Part 3. Now, in this lecture, we are going to read in details about the cytoskeleton, the cell to cell interactions and we are going to see the biosynthetic machinery that is the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus and in the end, we are going to sum up by discussing about the degradation taking place inside the cell, the role of lysosomes and proteasomes. So, let us begin today's topic of discussion. So, if you look at the cytoskeleton, as we already know that they are responsible for the maintenance of the cell shape, polarity, migration, organization of intracellular organelles. Now, if you see that there are three major classes of cytoskeleton. We have the actin microfilaments, the intermediate filaments and the microtubules. So, if you see the actin microfilaments, these are 5 to 9 diameter fibrils. And they are basically composed of globular protein actin called as the G actin. It is the most abundant cytosolic protein present in the cells. Now, these actin is they are non covalently, they polymerize with each other to form a long filament. This is called as F actin. So, G actin is going to polymerize non covalently to give rise to what is called as the F actin. And these F actin, these are nothing but double stranded helices having a positive end and a negative end okay it is at the positive end that the new subunits will keep on adding and at the negative end the subunits are removed okay this process is called as actin trade milling it is the process of addition and subtraction of subunits from the f actin that is called as the actin trade milling now basically the main function of this actin is it plays an important role in providing the cell shape as well as the movement and it is also associated with a motor protein that is called as myosin. Okay. So, ATP hydrolysis by the myosin will slide the actin filaments and that leads to what is called as muscle contraction. So, we all are well aware of the role of actin and myosin in muscle contraction. So, it is helping in cell shape along with the movement. Along with that, it is helping in muscle contraction as well. Now, other important functions of the actin, they include, uh, you know, your vesicular transport, epithelial barrier regulation and also cell migration. So, these are other functions of the actin filament. Okay. Now, we are going to understand about the intermediate filament. Now, these are 10 nanometer diameter fibrils. Okay. These are basically nothing but the keratin proteins and the nuclear lamins. Okay. Now, these are rope like polymers. I will show you with the help of diagram that how the intermediate filaments look like. Basically, they are associated mainly with the desmosomes and the hemidesmosomes. I will show you. And the major function of the intermediate filament, if you see, it is to provide tensile strength. Okay. It is to provide tensile strength. Okay. Very importantly, it provides tensile strength to bear the mechanical stress. Now, individuals, okay, individual intermediate filaments, if you see, they have a characteristic tissue specific pattern, okay, and this particular property of an intermediate filament can be used to assign the cell of origin for a poorly differentiated tumor. So, for example, if you have a poorly differentiated tumor with the help of immunohistochemistry, okay, you can point out different intermediate filaments and, the, and, and from there you can understand the cell of origin. For example, if you see the examples of intermediate filaments like Wymantin. Wymantin basically, you know, they are present in, they will come out to be positive in tumors of mesenchymal origin because they are present in mesenchymal cells. Similarly, if you see, desmin is another intermediate filament which is present in muscle tissue. So, any tumor of muscle origin will test positive for desmin. Similarly, neurofilaments, they are positive, they are present in the central nervous system and they are basically, you know, they are forming the axonal structure. They are helping, they are important components of the axonal structure. We have the next protein is the Jafab, that is glial fibrillary acidic protein, Jafab, okay. It is also present in the CNS and mainly they are present in the glial cells, okay. And then we are having cytokeratins, which are mainly, you know, present in the epithelial cell. So, cytokeratin positivity for any tumor means that they are of epithelial origin. Then we are having the lamins, okay. They are basically forming the nuclear lamina and they provide uh, the nuclear shape and it is important for nuclear transcription. So, these are the different types of intermediate filaments, the vimentin, desmin, neurofilament, glial fibrillary acidic protein, cytokeratins and lamins. Okay, and they are very helpful to assign the cell of origin for a poorly differentiated tumor. And the main role of intermediate filament is to provide tensile strength. Okay, 
Then the microtubules, if you see, they are the most dynamic structure that you will come across. So the microtubules, if you see, they are the most dynamic cytoskeleton structure. They are 25 nanometer thick fibrils and they are basically non-covalently polymerized alpha and beta tubulin dimer. So they are a dimer of alpha and beta tubulin and they are non-covalently polymerized and they are organized to form hollow tub tubes. Okay, they are organized to form hollow tubes. Now, they are extremely dynamic as I have already told and they are polarized. They are having two ends. Okay, They are having a positive end and they are having a negative end. Okay, Now, remember that the negative end of the microtubule, basically they are embedded in, a, in an area called as microtubule organizing center or centrosome that is around the nucleus or that is near to the nucleus. So, the negative end of the microtubule is embedded in a region called as microtubule organizing center MTOC or centrosome which is very close to the nucleus. If you look at the positive end, the positive end elongates or recedes in response to various stimulus okay, by either addition or subtraction of tubulin dimer. So, basically they will either elongate in size or they will reduce in size in response to various stimulus okay? and basically they do so by addition or subtraction of tubulin dimers with which they are made. Now, microtubules, if you look at the function of microtubules, there are multiple functions. The number one function of microtubules, they are serving as a line, a mooring line for molecular motor proteins that use ATP to translocate vesicles, organelles or other molecules. So, they are basically like a line which is used by a motor protein to transport either substances, macromolecules, vesicles or organelles from one part to other. Okay, so basically if you see, there are two parts. Okay, one is the kinesin if you see and one is the dynesin. These are the molecular proteins that is transporting. If you look at the kinesin molecular protein, they are responsible for anterograde transport of the cargo. And this happens from the negative to the positive end, from the negative to the positive direction. Okay, whereas the dynesin molecular protein, they provide retrograde transport of cargo from the positive to the negative direction. Okay, from the positive to the negative direction. So, these are the two important molecular motor proteins, okay, kinesin and dynesin, okay. Then the other function is microtubules, they are also mediating sister chromatid separation or segregation during mitosis process. Now, they are also forming the core of the primary cilia, okay. So, the, you know, and, and uh, very importantly, this primary cilia, if you see, they are regulating cellular proliferation and differentiation. If there is any abnormality in the functioning of the primary cilia, then the mutation in the proteins forming the cilia can lead to adult polycystic kidney disease. Okay, It is very, very important. The core of the primary cilia is formed by the microtubules and normally the cilia is regulating cell proliferation and differentiation. Now, mutation in the, in the proteins forming the cilia can lead to polycystic kidney disease. Okay. Not only that, they are also forming the core of motile cilia, okay, which is present in the bronchial epithelium okay, or which is present in the flagella in the sperms. Okay. So, these are the three important components of the cytoskeleton as we have seen with the actin microfilaments, intermediate filaments, microtubules along with their functions. I will show you with the help of diagram how they look. Okay. So, this is the particular diagram if you see. So, what we can see up, uh, you know over here if you see, we can see that there are two cells over here. So, this is one cell, this is one epithelial cell number one and this is basically if you see this is epithelial cell, epithelial cell number two. So, there are two epithelial cells one and two. So, what we can appreciate that the two cells they are basically joined with each other. Okay, And if we can appreciate over here the very first thing that I would tell you that over here if you see there are what is known as the actin filament that is the first cytoskeleton that we have read. Okay, If you see this is the actin filament. It is in close association with one kind of cell interaction that is adherent junction. Okay, Adherent junction is one type of cell interaction. We will read about that later on but this is the actin filament that we can appreciate over here. Okay. Okay. Number two, we had also read about the intermediate filaments. If you can see, these are the intermediate filaments number two. Now, they are basically, you know, providing tensile strength and they are present at the site. For example, at the desmosome. So, these are also the intermediate filaments which are radiating from the desmosome. So, this is a desmosome and from there, the black color molecule that is coming out is called as the intermediate filament. Okay. So, the intermediate filament is coming out of the hemidesmosome as well as the 
the desmosome okay and they are providing tensile strength and the third important thing that is we over here that is the microtubules as we can appreciate these are molecular motor lines so they are mooring lines you can appreciate these lines over here shown in green so they are nothing but the lines which is used by the molecular motors like the kinesin and dynesin to transport vesicles organelles or substances macromolecules across the cell okay so this is very important the three important structures actin intermediate filaments and the microtubules that we have seen we will come back to this diagram okay now we are going to start what is also called as cell to cell interaction how one cell is interacting with the other so for example over here as we have shown there is an epithelial cell over here this is the number one epithelial cells there is another epithelial cell on the left hand side as we can appreciate this is another epithelial cell that we can appreciate over here so what we are going to concentrate is the kind of interaction that is there between the two uh, what should I say between the two epithelial cell and how this interaction is formed it is very interesting to understand so if you see over here cell communication is occurring with the help of certain junctional complex okay and the communication occurs between two cells okay for example between two cells a communication is there or between one cell along with the extracellular matrix so the communication can be in between two cells or between one cell and the extracellular matrix there are three important types of communication so if we see in this diagram only i have highlighted over here if you see let me just you know uh, let me just remove this else you will be confused okay so what i want to tell you there are the ones okay the the important cellular interactions have been actually shown uh, you know that has been highlighted in yellow so if you see number one that is the tight junction over here yes everyone can appreciate this is the tight junction that is there between the two cells so first we are going to start with the tight junction the tight junction is also called as occluding junction so the main function is to seal adjacent epithelial cells so that a continuous barrier is created so for example this is one epithelial cell this is another epithelial cell and both of them they are joined together and they are sealed together to form an epithelial barrier with the help of this occluding junction or called as the tight junction so what is very important such kind of tight junction it restricts any paracellular movement of either ions or molecules so between the cell between two cell means the paracellular movement that is restricted by the tight junction number one number two the cell to cell interaction is mediated via a transmembrane protein which is called as cloudin and tamp family of protein that is tight junction associated marvel protein that is tamp so what i want to tell you just try to understand one important thing okay so for example if this is one cell and this is another cell okay any kind of junction when it is there there is one subunit and in between the two subunit okay there is one connecting protein which is called as adherent protein okay this that one that is shown in blue okay so any kind of junction whether it be tight junction gap junction or adherent junctions any kind of junction if you see there are two subunits of the junction and in between you have a transmembrane protein connected the two subunits okay that is basically the center part so as we are as, as we are reading over here that the cell to cell interaction is mediated via transmembrane protein and over here the transmembrane protein is cloudin and tight junction associated marvel protein also called as tamp protein what does it do it is connecting to the intracellular adapter and scaffolding protein so these tight junctions are in turn for example on the inner side they are connecting to what on the inner side they are connecting to intracellular adapter and scaffolding proteins what are these proteins that is zona occludens and cingulin so on the inner side they are attached to zona occludens and cingulin these are the intracellular and scaffolding uh, proteins that is there so always remember that the tight junction is mainly formed okay the interaction is mediated via a transmembrane protein that we call it as cloudin and tight junction associated marvel protein it is connected with the inner side of the cell there are many adapter and scaffolding proteins uh, for example zonula occludens and cingulin now the tight junction also separates the apical and the basolateral membrane domains and therefore they are helpful in maintenance of cell polarity tight junctions they can also facilitate epithelial healing 
and inflammatory cell migration as well. So, these are the important functions of the tight junction. Okay, very important sealing the adjacent epithelial cells. So, continuous barrier it is going to restrict the movement of ions and other molecules, large molecules. It is separating apical and basolateral membrane domains, so helping to maintain the cell polarity. It is also facilitating the epithelial healing and inflammatory cell migration. And it is mainly formed by transmembrane protein that is cloudin and TAMP, and it is connected to the inner protein proteins which are the zona occludens and cingulin okay this is all about the tight junctions that we have already read the next important type that is the anchoring junctions which is including two important junctions that is the adherent junctions and desmosome so just remember in any kind of such you know adherent junctions or desmosome remember there will be certain units like this okay this is for one cell this is another cell and in between there will always be a transmembrane protein okay so what is the function of anchoring junctions over here they attach the cells along with their cytoskeleton to other cells or extracellular matrix okay they are often closely associated with and they are lying just beneath or below the tight junction okay it is also called as adherence junction okay called as adherence junction so if you look at this particular diagram okay this was the tight junction so just beneath the tight junction you are having this classical adherence junction it is lying very close to the uh, it is lying very very close to the tight junction that is it is uh, very close to the tight junction as you can appreciate and this is called as the adherent junction okay always remember see there are two subunit protein and in between you are having a transmembrane protein for adherent junction desmosomes hemide for all of a gap junction also okay so if you see over here if you see over here the desmosomes the desmosomes in comparison to the adherent junctions they are more basally located and they form several types of of junctions okay so just see over here these are the desmosome they in comparison to the adherent junction so they are more lower and more basal okay so these are again the second type of interaction that is the anchoring junction that is the desmosome so they are more basal again you can see another desmosome over here okay you can see another desmosome and whenever if you have half a unit of a desmosome okay it is called as a hemidesmosome which is again under the anchoring uh, you know junctions only now hemidesmosome is different from the desmosome desmosome there are two subunits and they are basically connecting the two cells whereas hemidesmosome is facilitating the interaction with the extracellular matrix as you can appreciate and that occurs with the help of integrin protein i will discuss in details each and everything okay so basically over here the desmosomes as we have seen they are more basal now desmosome is attached to the extracellular membrane okay and that kind of desmosome which is attaching to the extracellular membrane with the help of integrin with the help of integrin they are called as hemidesmosome that means half as i have already shown you over here these are the hemidesmosomes as i have already shown you these are the hemidesmosomes they are a type of desmosome which is attaching with the extracellular matrix okay with the help of integrins and they are half a desmosome because they have half unit of desmosome therefore they are also called as hemidesmosome now remember both the anchoring junction as well as the desmosomes they are having a homotypic extracellular interaction between transmembrane glycoprotein called cadherin so what i am trying to tell you that whether it be adherin junctions or desmosome so they are having two very similar units present on for this is epithelial cell number one this is epithelial cell number two so this is a homotypic extracellular interaction both of them are same but in between they, there is a connecting protein okay this is called as cadherin okay cadherin and this entire unit this entire unit if you see this is called as either an adherent junction or a desmosome so let us see the application okay so if we are just amplifying whatever we had seen in that diagram so number one over here is the adherent junctions as i told you there are two very similar homotypic associates so there are these two subunits over here okay so basically remember this is epithelial cell number one this is epithelial cell number two this is magnified okay this is basically the intracellular environment of both of them okay so if you see the adherent junctions basically there are two important subunits externally and in the middle there is a cadherent protein and the cadherent protein is there in the middle which is the transmembrane protein okay and this together this entire unit together this forming the adherent junction okay now the adherent junction is connected intracellularly respectively intracellularly if you see this green colored substance is basically the actin so intracellularly the adherent junction is connected to the actin filament so the adherent junctions if you see 
दे आर मेंटेनिंग द सेल शेप they are maintaining basically if you see they are maintaining the cell shape and motility now if there is loss of epithelial adhesion junction protein for example if this transmembrane protein cadherin is lost if the e cadherin is lost it gives rise to a discohesive invasive pattern seen in gastric carcinoma as well as in lobular carcinoma of the breast and very importantly the adherin junction they are connected intracellularly by means of actin cytoskeleton okay and the clinical application is if there is a loss of epithelial adherin junction protein e cadherin it is going to give rise to a discohesive invasive pattern as seen in gastric carcinoma or lobular carcinoma of the breast the second important uh, you know uh, structure that is the desmosome which is again coming under the anchoring uh, filaments now if you see i have just magnified whatever we have seen over here so whatever we had seen over here yes this is basically if you see this is your desmosome so i am just magnifying whatever we are seeing the desmosomes if you look at the desmosome just like the adherin junction there are two units subunits which is there now if you see in between there is a transmembrane protein that is the cadherin in between and this unit together is called as the desmosome now just like the adherin junctions they were connected to the actin filaments so the desmosomes over here they are connected with the intermediate filaments and the cadherins which are linked to the intermediate filaments as you can appreciate okay they are basically allowing extracellular force to dissipate over multiple cells okay so this allows the dissipation of extracellular force over multiple cells that is the intermediate filament that is attached okay and then we are having the hemidesmosome which is half a desmosome this is providing the link of the cell to the extracellular matrix and that occurs with the help of the transmembrane protein that is integrin so the transmembrane protein in case of hemidesmosome it is the integrin and they are having only half the unit of a desmosome so they are called as hemidesmosome and they too are attached intracellularly just like the desmosomes with the with the intermediate filament okay now similarly if you see just like the adherin junction desmosomes hemidesmosome there is something called as focal adhesion complex which are composed of more than 100 proteins and they localized at the sites of hemidesmosome now generation of inter they are responsible for the generation of intracellular signals when subjected to shear stress okay so with this we have completed in details the discussion of anchoring junctions okay so we have done the occluding junction that is the tight junction we have discussed the anchoring junctions which is comprising of adherin junctions desmosomes hemidesmosomes and focal adhesion complex now we are going to read about the third important kind of junction that is the gap junction okay we will read about the gap junction so let let us understand about the gap junction so basically the it is a also called as the communicating junction and it permits the diffusion of chemical or electrical signals from one cell to another it is composed of 1.5 to 2 nanometer pores also called as connexon so the functional unit of the gap junction that is the connexon and this connexon if you see there are two subunits okay so they are made by a pair of subunits okay pair of hexamer transmembrane protein that is the connexin protein so there is a pair this is one so there is a pair so this is one and this two this two is a pair of hexamer protein so this transmembrane protein is actually actually called as connexin okay so let me just show you over here in this diagram as you can appreciate so this is basically the gap junction as we can appreciate this is one this is another so there is a pair of this hexamer unit protein that is called as connexon okay it's called as connexon so let let us try and understand so it is permitting the passage of ions nucleotides sugar amino acid as well as vitamin now the permeability rapidly reduced by intracellular ph or it can increased uh, or uh, you know or due to the increased uh, intracellular calcium concentration so perme so the permeability can be rapidly reduced by either intracellular ph or by increased intracellular calcium concentration it is responsible mainly for cell to cell communication for example the presence of gap junctions in the cardiac cell is allowing for cell to cell you know calcium flux or calcium movement okay and this allows the cardiac cells to behave as a functional unit and is responsible for coordinated waves of contraction okay so with this we have completed both the cytoskeleton as well as the cell to cell interactions i hope you have understood this in detail now we are going to start the biosynthetic machinery of a cell that is the endoplasmic reticulum and the golgi apparatus okay so all the cell constituents okay all the cell constituents 
like the structural proteins the enzymes transcription factors plasma membrane okay all the proteins structure like the enzyme transcription factor plasma membrane okay phospholipids even the membranes they need to be constantly renewed because constantly uh, you know th there is a synthesis and degradation of these proteins okay so the endoplasmic reticulum if you see it is the site for synthesis of all the transmembrane protein as well as the lipid which is destined for the plasma membrane and other cellular organelles okay the initial site for synthesis of secreted proteins okay is basically the er and the er there are two main types that is the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum so first we are going to start by discussing about the rough endoplasmic reticulum so if you look at the rough endoplasmic reticulum these are membrane bound ribosomes that means those ribosomes which are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane so they are basically membrane bound ribosomes present on the cytosolic phase of the rough endoplasmic reticulum they may they mainly translate the mrna into the proteins and then these proteins either will enter the endoplasmic reticulum lumen or they will get integrated with the endoplasmic reticulum membrane okay now this above process if you see is mainly initiated by a specific signal sequence which is present on the end termini end of certain nascent protein now remember it is not that from the beginning the protein starts to get synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum no initially any kind of protein synthesis will start on the free ribosomes which are present in the cytosol or in the cytoplasm now if they are synthesizing a protein which is having a signal sequence then that ribosome along with this protein and signal se uh, sequence the protein with the signal sequence they form a complex and then they translocate to the endoplasmic reticulum forming the rough endoplasmic reticulum then over here the translation continues now in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the proteins that are formed will now enter the endoplasmic reticulum or they will you know either they will enter the endoplasmic reticulum lumen or they are going to get you know attached to the endoplasmic reticulum membrane then that protein which is entering the lumen they will now fold they will get into an active conformation that means they will have a protein folding and this process is facilitated by means of certain proteins called as chaperons and uh, this protein folding will occur and then they are going to oligomerize and form a polypeptide complex okay and ultimately in the endoplasmic reticulum there will be some amount of glycosylation by addition of n linked oligosaccharide units okay so this is one way of protein synthesis which is taking place in the rough endoplasmic reticulum okay now some of the proteins which are synthesized by the free cytosolic ribosomes they synthesize certain proteins which lack a signal sequence in such a situation these proteins along with the ribosome they will not get associated with the endoplasmic reticulum but instead over here the translation process is going to continue on the free ribosomes in the cytoplasm itself and the protein synthesized they will remain inside the cytoplasm now one very important clinical application over here that folding of the proteins that are taking place in the endoplasmic reticulum if there is improper protein folding or improper process of oligo uh, oligomerization that protein will be retained inside the endoplasmic reticulum and they will be degraded if there is any problem okay with the proteins and there is a uh, you know formation of misfolded protein okay for example there is a condition called as cystic fibrosis which is characterized by mutation in the cftr protein so as a result these proteins they are misfolded and as a result they are degraded and therefore they are, are you know there is a reduced availability of these proteins in this patient responsible for the clinical sign symptoms of cystic fibrosis so improper protein folding can give rise to many kinds of disorders okay and such proteins are mainly retained and degraded in the endoplasmic reticulum so we have seen that basically the protein translation or basically mrna translation and protein synthesis can occur either in the er or in the cytoplasm depending on the initial signal that is present in that particular protein okay now for example if the amount of misfolded protein normally if the misfolded protein is there they will be retained and degraded in the endoplasmic reticulum but for example if the amount of misfolded protein they exceed the endoplasmic reticulum capacity to edit or to degrade so it is now beyond the capacity of the endoplasmic reticulum to degrade 
okay that particular protein then it will result into what is known as er stress response or upr response that is the unfolded protein response what is this response it is characterized by increased synthesis of chaperon protein and decreased synthesis of the defective protein so when the amount of misfolded protein is very high so you can com combat this situation in two ways you either increase the amount of chaperons if you re recall chaperons are proteins which are responsible for protein folding they help in protein folding you increase this and also you decrease the synthesis of this defective protein so these are the two ways okay by which the er stress response works okay so as to reduce the load of misfolded protein if the er stress or the unfolded protein response also fails then they are going to trigger the cell death by the process of programmed cell death that is apoptosis okay so this is about the rough endoplasmic reticulum now we are going to understand about the golgi apparatus now if you look at the golgi apparatus basically the rough endoplasmic reticulum they are synthesizing the proteins and lipids okay which is meant for other organelles or they are meant for export or they are meant to bind with the plasma membrane okay so all such substances which are synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum they are going to go into the golgi apparatus okay now the golgi apparatus they are having two ends one is the cis end which is near the endoplasmic reticulum which is going to receive all the packages the proteins and lipids from the rough endoplasmic reticulum and there is a delivery zone that is the trans end which is near the plasma membrane from where they are delivering everything now as the particular protein and lipids they are traveling from the cis end to the trans end there is sequential processing of the newly synthesized proteins okay now the golgi resident enzyme so whatever enzymes that is present or they are you know functioning inside the golgi apparatus they are maintaining this entire processing okay and uh, very importantly uh, they maintain this entire processing they are mainly shuttling from the trans end to the cis end so the golgi resident enzymes they are shuttling from the trans to the cis end but whatever proteins and lipid that is coming from the rough endoplasmic reticulum they go from the cis end and they end and they are delivered at the trans end okay okay now very importantly we have to understand that in the endoplasmic reticulum if you remember there was n linked oligosaccharides addition that is n linked glycosylation was there in the endoplasmic reticulum but what happens over here that whatever n linked oligosaccharides they were added in the er they are pruned pruned mean they are not removed they are just little bit you know you know little bit they are pruned that mean little bit they are made less okay and this is followed by o linked oligosaccharide addition this is also added over here so o linked oligosaccharide they are added mainly in the golgi apparatus and this is called as glycosylation now why is glycosylation important remember by the process of glycosylation okay we can decide what proteins and lipids are going to go where now for example this is responsible for sorting of molecules to the lysosome so those enzymes which are destined to work inside the lysosomes there is addition of mano 6 phosphate so this these glucose these sugar units are added to the enzymes which are destined for lysosomes and these such packages containing these particular mano 6 phosphate they will enter the lysosomes via the mano 6 phosphate receptor which is present on the surface of the lysosome again this glycosylation also helps in cell to cell or cell to matrix interaction and in clearing of senescent cells as well now at the trans end if you look at the trans end the proteins and lipids they are sorted and they are dispatched as i told you this is the point of delivery okay and they will be delivered to either other organelles to plasma membrane or they will be exported out in the form of secretory vesicle okay now the golgi complex is quite prominent in the cells which are specialized for secretory activity example the goblet cells which are present in the intestine whose main function is synthesis of mucus or plasma cells basically whose main function is synthesis of antibodies okay remember the plasma cells the, uh, they are having a lot of golgi apparatus which is exemplified by the presence of perinuclear hop this perinuclear hop is example is nothing but it is exemplifying the presence of golgi apparatus which is an important mcq in the exam coming to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum it is basically a transition zone extending from the rough endoplasmic reticulum to generate transport vesicles okay they carry newly synthesized proteins to the golgi apparatus 
Now, mainly the main function is steroid hormone and lip lipoprotein synthesis. That is why you will see increased amount of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in organs which are synthesizing steroid hormones like the gonads and the adrenals. Or they are basically or that or, or they, they you will see increased concentration of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in organs that catabolize lipid soluble substance like the hepatocytes. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they also sequester and store calcium ions and this calcium can help in signaling or they can also regulate the process of apoptosis. So, this is the number one function. They sequester intracellular calcium which can help as a secondary messenger or in signaling or in apoptosis. In the muscles, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is specialized to form the sarcoplasmic reticulum which sequesters and stores the calcium ions with cyclical release and which is responsible for muscle contraction, responsible for muscle contraction, okay? which is responsible for muscle contraction. Now, with this, we have completed the second part and now we are going to start the waste disposal. Now, waste disposal is mainly taking place at the level of lysosomes and at the level of proteasomes. Now, remember, any kind of internalized endocytosed material and accumulation of any internal waste inside the cell, they are primarily digested in the lysosome. They are the major sites of digestion of these substances. Other sites of digestion includes the proteasomes and the peroxisomes. Now, if we start with the lysosomes, if you see, these are membrane bound organelles, which is containing 40 different acid hydrolysis and the pH uh, inside, uh, you know, the lysosomes is maintained less than equal to 5 or lower. Okay, and why the pH is less? Because the lysosomal enzymes, they are working best under this pH. Now, what are the different types of enzymes that we find over here? We are having the proteases, nucleases, lipases, glycosidase, phosphatase and sulfatases. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum, they are synthesizing the lysosomal enzymes. Enzymes are nothing but one type of proteins. And if you remember, glycosylation is taking place in the Golgi apparatus by addition of mannose-6-phosphate. And these secretory vesicles containing the lysosomal enzymes, they reach the lysosomes and they enter via the mannose-6-phosphate receptor. Okay, now there are three pathways for the macromolecules to reach the lysosome. How they can reach the lysosome? So, already we have re read in the previous lecture about the receptor mediated, uh, you know, endocytosis. So, there all these molecules was reaching the lysosome and there was lysosome, uh, you know, and late endosome fusion. This was one way. Why the receptor mediated endocytosis, the receptor contents, whatever contents they were going inside, they were forming the endosome, they were, you know, fusing with the lysosome to form a complex and then the, the material was or the macromolecule were digested. Another way that we had already read was phagocytosis, wherein the microbes or, or dead decaying matter, they were endocytosed and they were fusing with the lysosome to form phagolysosome. Okay, these two ways we already know. And there is one third way also that we will see. So, the material ingested by fluid phase or receptor mediated endocytosis. So, if you see from the plasma membrane, there is formation of early endosome as we can appreciate over here. Then a late endosome where the pH falls, okay, and where lysosomal enzymes can work and ultimately they fuse with the lysosome, okay, wherein degradation of material will occur. So, this was the first way. The second way was when the senescent organelles or large denatured protein complex, they undergo autophagy. Okay, and they combine with the lysosome and they form autophago lysosome. Now, very, very important thing over here is what is autophagy? Autophagy means uh, it is a method of survival during nutrient deprivation when the cell is eating its own content so as to derive energy. So, any kind of senescent organelles or any kind of denatured protein, okay, they derive the, the membrane, okay, from the endoplasmic reticulum and the membrane elongates to encircle, okay, and uh, they contain the senescent organs along with the denatured protein and along with the membrane derived from the ER, they form what is called as an autophagosome. This autophagosome will now fuse with the lysosome to form autophagolysosomes, wherein all the material will be finally degraded. This is the second method, okay, of uh, how the substances are reaching the lysosome. This is autophagy. Now, the details about autophagy will be taught in the next chapter, that is the chapter number 2, cell injury. Okay? And the third way is via phagocytosis, as I have already shown you, via the phagocytosis of microorganisms or large fragments of matrix or debris, uh, which is taking place mainly in the macrophages and the neutrophils. Phagosome is forming phagolysosome. So, either by phagocytosis or by autophagy or by receptor mediated endocytosis, these are the three mechanisms by which the macromolecules are reaching the lysosomes. 
Then we are going to see other type of degradation that is the proteasomal degradation. They have a very important role in degradation of cytosolic proteins, example denatured or misfolded proteins or other regulated macromolecules. The proteins which are destined for degradation, they are mainly tagged by small proteins called as ubiquitin. Then they will be polyubiquitinated. Multiple such ubiquitin is going to bind with that protein. They will go to the proteasomal complex which is nothing but a shredding machine where the protein digestion will occur into small 6 to 12 amino acid fragments and ultimately very small amino acids are formed which are recycled. So, if we see inside the cytosol how this is working. So, this is a nascent peptide chain which with the help of chaperons they are folded. Normally, we are getting a folded protein. Now, for example, any kind of damage occurs because of aging, because of UV light, because of heat, because of reactive oxygen species, these folded proteins, they become senescent denatured protein or they become misfolded. So, what happens over here with the help of ligases, okay, multiple free ubiquitin molecules, they are getting tagged and there is multiple ubiquitin which is getting attached to this particular protein. So, what is happening that there is a shredding machine inside the cell, inside the cytoplasm called as a proteasome complex and it is recognizing any such protein which is misfolded or denatured which has been polyubiquitinated wherein multiple such ubiquitin has been attached and then these proteins are basically broken down okay, into multiple such peptide fragments. Ultimately, amino acids are form which is then recycled. So, this is the process of proteasomal degradation taking place in the cytoplasm. Again, very importantly, another such process is there for misfolded proteins that we have seen which is taking place in the endoplasmic reticulum, wherein because of any kind of metabolic alterations or genetic mutations or viral infections, misfolded proteins are increased in amount which triggers what is known as ER stress response that is the unfolded protein response characterized by increased uh, decreased protein synthesis and increased chaperon synthesis and if this fails it is going to lead to apoptosis. So, with this we have completed the waste disposal in details as well. Thank you very much for watching this particular video. If you have liked please do share and subscribe this video. Thank you very much.